Welcome to Booklandia, where we review romance novels. This and every episode are chock full of oversharing and spoilers. Every episode is rated E for explicit. I too can wear a pink knit shawl for this episode. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. That's I'm Sky. <laughs> yeah, that's Sky. That's... Sky's wearing a yeah, and then I'm Ford, and I'm also wearing a pink knit, beautiful <laughs> handmade. Excellent. Um, so in <laughs> then we we have to start over. So uh, I'm never. Sky. And that's Ford. Oh, and yeah. this joke is visual, so please go find it <laughs> in, on YouTube so you can understand what's happening. Uh, because, and this will make slightly more sense when we see the cover of the book for me. And then maybe the, the rest of the joke will make sense. And if not, just enjoy the antics. Yeah, whatever. We're feeling sassy. We sure are. Um, today, we are going to talk about Wicked and the Wallflower by Sarah McLean, which is uh, a first in the Bare Knuckle Bastards series, a title that is really hard for me to get out of my <laughs> mouth hole. Um, so I will not be saying it enough times for it to matter. Uh -huh. yes. Anytime you feel like you need to say it, just like point at me and I'll say it for you. Great. And we'll Thank see you. how well I do. All right. Because um, I'm on my second cider. Uh, yes, that is that is important. Um, as a check-in for me, some nightshade yeah. is blooming outside, and it is Ugh. destroying me. So I am both crying and sneezing, but neither one mm. of those are an emotional response to the book we're about to discuss. Is that called creasing? <laughs> 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 no. Is this a suggestion? Okay. 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 I cannot be called well. creasing. That is the least <laughs> appealing noise I've ever heard. Um, I listened to you sneeze five times in a row. I think creasing is kind of a cute way to put it. Um uh so allergic to nightshades, do you also cry at tomatoes? Uh no. Oh, I did just okay. plant some tomatoes, but no, I haven't previously. Um, mm. No, uh, Maybe this is new. Because they're like nightshade light. Right, yeah, yeah no, okay. tomatoes and I are usually mm -hmm. friends, but I am allergic mm -hmm. to a bunch of things that pollinate, and it is it is pollinating season. It is getting sexy with some trees out there, and my entire being would like for that to stop, hard stop. Uh, so... <laughs> Do you think that, like, so pollination happens, and do you think that they make some people cry as a response just so they can get watered by tears? Like, do you think this is, like, an intentional thing that plants are doing to us? Uh, no. There's no <laughs> way that whatever's coming out of my face is going to be helpful to anyone. Um, no. <laughs> but have you ever watered a plant with your tears? Because that feels punk rock. <laughs> I have not, but I will put that on okay. the list if there is such um, a list. So my check-in today is going to be show and tell. So we just got back from our 4th of July holidays, and I was up in Green Bay and, uh, you know, like slept in the grass. Yeah. Oh, did do you, you know bring, what my show and tell is Did you be? bring oh, the... Okay. Absolutely, I brought it. Um <laughs> So, like, slept on the grass right beside the beach and listened to the waves and walked along the beach and picked up, you know, uh, sea glass. I guess it's not lake glass? Is it lake glass? I don't like lake glass as a phrase. Um, you know, picked up some trash and some micro, well, not some macro plastics, let's be honest. Um, apparently people shoot shotguns into, the, I don't know. I picked up a lot of shotgun shells. It was very weird. And um, I want you to know that Green Bay appreciated my efforts and, um, well, found me extremely arousing because I found this lovely piece of driftwood that is essentially an erect penis. This is an erect penis of driftwood, everyone. 
you have you have sort of the plane of the body with a a rising um shaft of driftwood and it even has like a like a a, a head shape so to speak sort of a anyway so i thought everyone may appreciate the uh, what is this six five inches green bay's got a five incher all right well that's average so well done green bay yeah well done everyone <laughs> so uh, i'm gonna put this in the uh in the background for our future episodes because it brings me so much joy oh yeah that's that's definitely a thing we should we should easter egg in the back at hard agree absolutely great um Shall we talk about this lovely historical novel, Wicked and the Wallflower by Sarah McLean? Oh, I'm always backwards with my camera. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so here is the cover. So here's the, the story. We read Bombshell and it was mm -hmm. wonderful and lovely. And mm -hmm. go read that if you haven't yet. The second in the Hell's Bell series, which is what Bombshell is the beginning of, comes out soon, but not soon enough. Mm -hmm. So we're yeah. doing some back catalog reading of Sarah McLean, and I am so glad you made me do this because, hell yes. You're welcome! So um, the reason I'm wearing my pink um, cover-up is because it is the same fuchsia color as the color of the dress and the lettering on this um yeah on this uh bodice right. ripper so the things to know about this is that uh this lovely woman is not wearing historically accurate clothing and that's sort of like mm -hmm. the name of the game for these covers is that they're all yeah. made out of taffeta and they're super tacky and i think it's meant to like um either encourage or discourage people from picking it up i my hope is that it right. encourages people who uh, pick up romance novels? Wait, wait, wait. Like... Can you put it back? Because yeah. I I find your costume history knowledge very intriguing, and I would like for you to tell me what is inaccurate. I mean, obviously well, the fact that you can see her kneecaps. I was going to say very it's wrong. it's a mini skirt in the middle, <laughs> and then like it splits out at the bodice to reveal the mini skirt. So like that to begin it with. <laughs> it's a dress mullet, is what you're trying to say. <laughs> it it does it does have a an actual name for that kind of silhouette, but typically in the fifties it was pants in the middle and then the mm -hmm. cape, the the back of the skirt situation in the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So none of this is accurate, and none of this is the type of dress that is described in the book itself, because mm -hmm. there is a lot of talk about not only the dress but the underpinnings that she wears under the dress, mm -hmm. which are all very well researched and period appropriate. Mm -hmm. So um, read the book for the appropriateness. My thought has yeah. been that the reason that it is uh, a little bit shiny, because shiny mm. taffeta is used for this, is mm -hmm. so that people can pick it up thinking that it's their average historical and then get smack dabbed in the face with some feminism in their historical and that's I very that. true i also wonder if that fabric just photographs better because it is a lie it is a human person cover um and like the the light reflecting off of that dress especially sort of down as it falls off of whatever she's sitting on is lovely so yeah. um Puffy sleeves? Were puffy sleeves, period? Oh, we, so there's a, there are a couple of different sleep, sleeve times. Most, yes, but short answer. T TLDR, yes. Puffy sleeve, Great. accurate. Excellent. Excellent. I mean, but I like, hate puffy sleeves. I was raised in the 80s and therefore I'm allergic to them, but good to know that that part of the dress, spot on. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, there, it, I have yeah a lot of commentary um like uh there that like the sleeves would not be the same as the bod the rest of the bodice they would actually mm -hmm. be separate because they'd be part of the chemise and then there would be a course mm -hmm. we are not getting into this lecture <laughs> but I Just, want to maybe I not so on much. the episode maybe after okay. the episode I can tell you all about it so Could beyond you, please, the fact can we just 
no, I'm so sorry. Can we just do a, like a whole sidebar secondary uh, social media campaign where you just do reels about inaccuracies in book cover costuming? Just, I'm just, I'd be really oh, interested. That I, would be would have one follower. <laughs> that would be a yeah, but it would be a lot of episodes. Um, yeah, I would also then have to do ones on like historical uh, fiction that describes not historically appropriate costumes or or clothing mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that happens a lot. I yell at books a lot mm -hmm. when that happens. So uh, this yeah, is a safe place thing. for you to yell at costume <laughs> inappropriate, inaccurate. Um, outfit. Excellent. I just I Thank just wanted you. you to know. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. You're welcome. Um, so sorry so I interrupted. Uh, historical inaccuracies on the cover aside, like I said, in the book itself, actually quite accurate. There's a lot of conversation about what they're wearing, how they're wearing it, mm -hmm. where they're wearing it, and which parts of them are not being uh, covered by anything. And it's sort of very exciting. <coughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Not a lick of cotton on that crotch. Not a, if you don't know what that is about, what that reference is about, go to the previous <laughs> episode. It will be explained. Uh -huh. um, before yeah. we get too far into it, shall we? Is this you wrote this? So I am reading this. I did. Oh yeah, I did. I, I was that's like, why I was like, that's very fun. That's fun and clever. Yeah, you can read this. Oh boy. Okay. I am underprepared, everyone. Have Just you, so you know. Have you read it at all? Or is this a no. cold read? Cold read, for sure. That's why yes. I was like, this, these are not yes. my words. These are definitely <laughs> not my words. <laughs> Excellent. I'm so excited. In a five, six, seven, eight. Lady Felicity Faircloth is another woman whose sole purpose, that's misspelled, is to solve all her family's issues by marrying well. All of London has set their eyes on the reclusive and hot Duke of Marvick, and Devil, a smuggling king, can make the Duke choose Felicity. With the deal made, neither of them can seem to walk away and let the future fall into Felicity's pink lap. Her pink lap? No, I got that part. Eyebrow, uh, eyebrow wiggle, eyebrow wiggle. Yeah, there's... A, thank you for calling out the wrong word, soul homonym. I also realized I wrote uh, marring instead of marrying. So... Yeah, I corrected that it, one. I just did a but, great job. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yes, whose you. is also woman whose... Uh, anyways, you guys, you do okay. not need to know about the spelling errors, but I need you to know that uh, I always get called out on them, so this is just payback. No, I'm here <laughs> for it. Please. Please. So, you know, they... this this book is feminist equality. Like, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> so the short and the long of it is that there is something happening between Devil, Beast, and the Duke of Marvick. Um, and we find out the three of them mm -hmm. and another person named... Dahlia, um, that is her <laughs> moniker, not her real name. Um, mm -hmm. They are all siblings, and there is something going on between the four of them where Devil is trying to prevent mm, the Duke of Maverick, whose name is Ewan. Did you just call him the Duke of Maverick? <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> yes. Marvick. It. Have you tried saying ma, ma oh I can't. It's no just Maverick. Um Okay, okay. Um am I being a total American because it's spelled Marwick? Oh maybe Marwick. Marwick. I actually don't know. Okay. I okay. yeah. I, I, this I'm is being extremely German, I guess, by calling it Marvick. Yeah. The yeah, Duke of uh, Marvick. It might be Marvick. Either way, his name is Ewan, right? So Ewan uh -huh. Wit, Devil, and Dahlia all have something going on. They're all uh, siblings, and for some yeah. reason, Devil doesn't want Ewan to marry and to father an heir. Uh, Felicity mm -hmm. really wants to be married for the sake of her family, and mm -hmm. um, in a haughty moment, tells everyone that she's engaged to the Duke, which is not true. Where, which is where Devil comes in. Um, and yeah. promises her that he can make that truth, he can make that become the truth. Mm -hmm. Here, I'm headed mm -hmm. somewhere with all of this exposition. 
Great. Yes. So here's the thing. I understood Felicity's needs and Felicity's motivations very early on mm -hmm. and why she agreed to the deal with the devil and why she continued to pursue the deal with devil and all of her sort of conflicting emotions about it. What wasn't mm -hmm. nearly as clear to me are devil's motivations. It, they, they say all of them, all of the siblings over the course of the book, seven bajillion times, that's a bajillion, mm -hmm. that uh -huh. the Duke cannot father an heir, right? Like we hear that constantly, but we do not and find out why uh -huh. for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what's, was really unclear to me in this book is, uh, they just kept saying no heirs. And I thought it meant all of them, like none of them, none of the brothers, uh, could father heirs because, and, and so what we learn is that, uh, well, the prologue tells us that all three of them are brothers and they are, um, illegitimate sons of the Duke of Marwick. I'm going to say Marwick because that's how it is in my brain. Um, and, and they, he was a total asshat to them and abused them and, uh, psychologically emotionally physically and and made them abuse each other it was like a just a whole shit storm and so they decided that they were not going to perpetu perpetuate the marwick line there would be no more dukes um for because that's all their father wanted was a legacy um so the fact that it was just ewan that they were focused on was really unclear to me because they're all, they would be perpet if all, any of them had children, they'd be perpetuating the line. So I was very confused by that throughout the book. And I've since read the other two books and it becomes more clear, especially in the third book. But um, yeah, it like they say it a lot and they don't clarify why for a while. You're right. So yeah, so I was <coughs> like, I get why she's doing it, but I don't really get uh -huh. why he's doing it other than he's interested in her company. But like right. how I, how yeah. the web tangled was yeah. a lot less clear to me. He yeah, he just wanted to be with her, but I think he also wanted to manipulate Ewan and he he you know, he could do that because he made a deal with the other person. Like Ewan wants to get married and he wants it it was easy and convenient and whatever and and Devil could snatch that away from him at his leisure because he made this deal so it was duly convenient um so i i came to this book and i read this book because of how feminist bombshell was like incredibly feminist i was all about it i was like you can't just start writing feminist historicals like the other her backstock had to have some of that in there and that's and so i came to this um, and what I really love about Sarah McLean is that all of her series uh, can join together. Again, it's a, like a loose network of characters. So characters that we see in Bombshell show, show up in this series. And so I knew that I was going to be ex seeing some of those when I started this. Um, but I found in reading this that this book had less external physical action than bombshell bombshell you know they were trying to figure out who was attacking all of these clubs and bars and women-owned businesses and they get into a lot of fights and like there was just a lot of like we got to go to here and we got to ride take a carriage toot sweet this away and this this book did not have it it was more like i have to put on this pretty dress and go to this thing more sort of traditional historical um, which do you have a preference? This I one or Bombshell? Don't love court intrigue. Um, I mm -hmm. get confused with like what is proprite, like what is proper and what is not. Like it just this is where historicals are not my uh, bread and butter, and so I periodically i'm like oh another ball and then they're like no this one is more ball than the previous ball and <laughs> someone touched someone's mm. elbow and i'm like oh i've forgotten all of those rules already so i prefer yeah. the bombshell style like hard and fast action and mm -hmm. everything's a little bit adrenaline driven and 
the second in this series, Brazen and the Beast, starts on an adrenaline rush, and it is mm -hmm. lovely. It is wonderful, mm -hmm. and it grabbed me yeah. a lot more than this one did. Though I do love yeah. me a man shrouded in shadow and mystery. That, yeah, that first scene where he just stands in the shadows and talks to her, I'm like, oh, hello. If this wasn't an outdoor balcony, I'd be quite shimmery. Um, I had a thought, and now you just made me think about how shadowy devil is, and I am for it, which we were going to talk about after the break. How rude. Oh, um, this book series, I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong, though, I don't know if this is your knowledge base, but uh, Duke... And then like Marquise. Yes. And then like other other sorts of, like Duke is like the pinnacle of titles. Yeah, you want a duchy. That's, that's you want to be a kick-ass Duke. Right. I see. Um yeah, you want to be a Duke. Huh. Dukes are really high up. And then it yeah. scale yeah, and then it's uh, a marquee or marquis. Marquess, if you say yeah. the, the English way, which is just the worst. Um, and then it's like the, worst. the other gentry, and then it's the mm -hmm. military, and then it's mm -hmm. the, the clergy. The <laughs> clergy and then the plebeians, which is, they're not called yeah. the plebeians. Okay. They're, they're called yeah. the regular people. <laughs> yeah. So the third book in the series, uh, Daring and the Duke, makes that clear because there's a lot of like i'm the duke power plays um and i was like oh okay thank you for teaching me uh you know those things english Books. peerage hierarchy thank you thank you for all the fancy words i should have pointed at you oh my god there are we, we go. gonna have a mad lib episode where we just point at each other, <laughs> point to each say other. The other fill in the other blanks brilliant um, i mean that sounds kind of fun. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, this next thing yeah. is, I think, just a statement, mostly. Not, okay. There's no question okay. here. So I, so uh, Devil lurks in the shadows a lot, which mm -hmm. sounds mm -hmm. super mm -hmm. uncomfortable and creepy, actually, if nope. you, like, take away the charm of it. Like, just a man mm -hmm. talking to you from the shadows. And then he's in her bedroom, and all she sees are her, his, like, long legs and his cane sitting in a chair just chatting mm -hmm. with her um you know if if his uh intentions were sinister this would have been a murder mystery and this is how she yeah. dies so mm -hmm. um it's just interesting to if me if this that, was like, a a gothic novel it would right. have been way creepier yeah yeah but like uh somehow instead of it being creepy and uncomfortable i was like uh stay in the shadows for longer and talk to me with your sexy please, voice yeah. please and thank yeah. you i think it it's the fact that nothing horrible can happen to a character when they're wearing pink oh that is a <laughs> lovely right? conception i do have to say I, that it, it's a balance it it's averages balance. I do have to say that the I did not mind all of the mentions of pink and how pink can still mm -hmm. be a power color. Uh, what I did mm -hmm. mind is all of the, like, your last name is Faircloth, so you're a princess in a yeah. tower. And I was like, yeah. okay, if we have to. Your name is but Devil. a princess. Right, right. And that's the thing is that they're playing against the name that society, like, they're the the name is a mask but that's not the person that's inside so like yes society thinks that she is a princess in a tower but she can pick that lock baby and go wherever she wants like she's and, got skills and i got that with all of her felicity alliterations but she didn't mm -hmm. pick her last name right like he chose yeah. devil she did not choose fair cloth it's just her family name and i was like i get it it says fairy cloth and so she's fair and genteel like it just got brought up so many times that i was just like woof mm -hmm. well it was intentional because he always called her felicity fair cloth like he always reminded her that she is a la like she's lady she's a, a society woman she doesn't belong with a guy named devil like he was always trying to juxtapose them 
um, for to for what, his own motivations, right? Um, and yeah, I get it. It was a little redundant and a little on the nose that her last name was Faircloth. I like absolutely, and that she loved pink dresses. Um, but it it wasn't as laborious for me. I didn't I didn't find it as exhausting. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Devil gave me serious, like throughout the whole book, gave me serious Kaz from the Grishaverse from Six of Crows vibes. Like the I think it was the cane and wearing all black and like being the head of a, you know, underworld, a dark underworld that is actually has a heart of gold. Underworld with a heart of gold. Um, did you get the same vibe? So you think I has ha so the only interactions with Kaz, the character that I have had, is the uh, original uh, novels of the Grishaverse. Mm. I have not read the Six of Crows series, so he, in my head, he's like a playful uh, teenager who's got a wicked streak and not like a dark overlord with a cane, which I think he develops later. Um, mm -hmm. but I definitely, like, there, there are quite a few characters out there who are, like, the alienist is, uh, is one that I thought oh, about yeah. a lot. Um, that's good. And, like, that's a lot more gruesome, but, uh, like, mm -hmm. that's a very similar time period, though it's in New York instead of in London, but nonetheless, like, yeah. it, like, it fit that, that sort of, like, underworld with a heart of gold yeah. situation, so... Not cast. Interesting. Cast, okay. Yes. Uh, yes. To to those to all those men in their tailcoats and their top hats. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I could not get over the fact that like uh, that devil was making this power play, and so he sent Felicity an outfit to wear to a party, including the underwear. Like, including the panties with the pink ribbons. Um, like, that was a very smooth, like, very sexy power play. Uh, too enthusiastic thumbs up. That was, I, mean, I, I dug that. I mean, in modern clothing, I would say the underwear is necessary because what if the dress you send requires specific undergarments? And mm -hmm. there, it would be presumptuous to assume that the person would have those so undergarments. In this instance, it was absolutely <laughs> a, now I have clothed her in every, like, I know exactly what she's wearing. Uh-huh. Top mm -hmm. to bottom. And it's, it's, it's scintillating. Like, yeah, that's, that's absolutely yeah. the power Yes. Life. Yes. Um, do you, do you find that sort of power play erotic? Or tantalizing. I uh, I did in the book. I probably would raise an eyebrow at it. IRL. Mm, mm. It, which I find interesting because of the two of us, you are the one to wear sexy underwear to make you feel sexy. Yes, but sexy underwear I choose for myself. Mm. Mm. Not ones that someone else has chosen for me. I think I would overthink it too much, honestly. Yeah, instead of instead of just being like, oh, someone paid attention to my favorite color and wants to know that I'm wearing these underwear. Like that, yeah, I could see where the, uh-huh, okay. I've gone down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, you know, someone should try and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Someone should try. Hint, hint, Adam. <laughs> oh, yikes. Uh, I will not report back. I will probably report back, you guys. Uh, it's Please. Me. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> come on. Okay. So uh, this is a thing I want to geek out about a little bit. Oh, yeah. and I just noticed how I spelled uh, historically in, in our script. And it is uh -huh. historically, you guys. Um, so there is uh -huh. this scene um, that begins and ends on a, um, a rounded bench or a curved bench called the Whispering Bench. And the idea mm -hmm. is that two people sit far away from each other or rather 
uh, yeah, they're on opposite ends of this curve and they speak in whispers. And because of the way the hedge is formed around them and the shape of the bench, the other person can hear what they're saying perfectly well. Mm -hmm. This is a real mm -hmm. thing. This yeah. is an actual bench created by an actual person trying to talk to their lover in broad daylight without broadcasting it to the world. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that is above and beyond buying someone lingerie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So this bench existed in this garden and they talk a little bit about the history of this bench and how they thought that the previous, um, woman of the house was a lover to the gardener, like she and the gardener were lovers. And so he had this bench installed for them so that they could be strategic in their romancing. So in the afterword of the book, Sarah McLean talks about mm -hmm. the fact that this is a real bench. Mm -hmm. And it's not a bench in that particular garden, but the mm -hmm. whispering bench is a real artifact built for two people to talk to each other in whispers in public, mm -hmm. um, which is... Uh, and all well, like I wouldn't know about it <laughs> well that that's the kind of thing that exists in other places like I've been to and I can't remember any of them to save my life um Finn if you remember any of these please insert your <laughs> quip your your here, addendum here. here please please put addendum here <laughs> yeah yeah okay so that was that was really interesting, Finn. Thank you so much for adding that in. I don't remember that at all. Um, but like, yeah, I've experienced, I've been in these places where you can stand somewhere and, and hear someone talking. It's, Finn would really geek out on this because it's all sound and audio yeah. and stuff like that. But it exists in other ways. Like sound is an incredible thing and your ear is an incredible organ. And I know it's not an organ, but like piece of body. Uh, so it's an organ yeah there's parts to it multiple multiple parts to it yeah is it technically an organ it has moving parts it can't okay be doctors doctors come at us like i'm i is the ear an organ i will google this later or <laughs> whatever um i yes i really love that scene it was sexy as hell um yeah uh, definitely into it Sarah McLean is the boss. She's awesome. Yes. Shall shall we do a break? Yeah, this is a good this is a good spot cuz then we're going to get into uh all of the favorite mm. bits of the rest of the book. All right, we will Let's be get right into back. our favorite bits. We're going to take an intermission. When we come back, we will discuss our favorite moments from the book and if this book made us want to get naked. All right, and we are back, and we are talking about Wicked and the Wallflower by Sarah McLean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and this book is kind of the original on Wednesdays We Wear Pink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except, like, on every day she wears pink, so. Uh, yeah, on all days she wears pink. This is more of a, like, I'm reclaiming pink as a power <laughs> color sort of a situation. This mm -hmm, is like a mm -hmm. mean girls forever, except she's neither mean nor really a girl, but a, a fully, fully grown woman, <laughs> fully functioning adult, uh, in my opinion. Nice. All right. Nice, Dave. Nice. <laughs> Thanks. I, yeah, that's what I meant. I didn't mean anything <laughs> other, but. Um, okay. We are going to talk about yeah. our favorite moments. And before the yeah. break, we sort of already talked about the whispering yeah. bench and the fact mm -hmm. that that is a historical artifact that exists and that, like these really cool spaces exist where you can communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. I have to bring us back to that moment because my favorite part of the whispering bench is not only the fact that it is historically accurate, but that he goes down on her in the middle of a garden. Yeah. And that yeah. is a thing that happens to the anybody. wallflower. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody. And anybody could walk up. I was like, anybody could show up. Oh my God, he's going to still do it. And I just kept flipping pages. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, I, yep. It, but also, like, 
that bench is made of concrete stone um uh, it's probably carved out of wood actually in that time period it's probably uh, not i mean it might be marble which is cold mm. but she's sitting on her skirts okay i that's mean she true. like that's right? true oh it's just a flip up yeah okay okay because okay. they do talk okay. about that was, and then um I was worried her... about coarseness on buttocks I right worried. i don't i, I don't think yeah. that that is a thing that she worries about at all because she also yeah. never removes her undergarments he simply parts them because in this time period the the yeah. everything is crotchless so you mm -hmm. just move aside the two parts <laughs> of the pant like, oh, this is more costume history dang it <laughs> yay i've done it yes so what you're saying is it's a lot like a boxer or a boxer brief but further down like yeah the, the, yeah the seam is fully open and it's just an overlap placket and then for all of your needs you wouldn't actually remove the um the bloomers you would simply part them to uh to do the things and that is actually in the text there is a line in the text yeah where he parts the breeches or the the bloomers yeah um, for men, like obviously there's like a frontal penisy peeing element, but is it uh is it still the um the butt flap for when they gotta go twosies? No, uh not typically. So uh this gets really much more complicated, but in most instances mm. they're either wearing a pair of breeches that have a leather flap on the front that uh basically like buttons down to yeah. uh to like open the entire front bit uh and mm -hmm. then they just take the back off like so they're like it remains up on the thighs the two pant legs remain mm -hmm. on and then like mm -hmm. the entire construction then like falls down is this clear in any way <laughs> Our, I, all I'm picturing is they didn't push the, down their thighs far enough and now they're pooping into their pants. I'm sure so, that did yeah. happen. Great job. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure, I mean, gotta, I'm sure that they got used to like, forward. yeah, you got to like tuck it yeah. under so that it doesn't <laughs> get caught in the process. I'm sure that's a whole thing. Yeah. Welcome to Booklandia. We talk about poop. And uh, tucking it My under. <laughs> And tucking it under. That's a that's tuckings for drag queens. Let's let's leave that to them. Uh my favorite compelling moment, favorite slash compelling moment. Uh I really liked how Sarah McLean set up the fact that Felicity knows how to lockpick. She taught herself. Um, she uses it kind of at different moments throughout the book, and then it becomes very essential in the climax of the book. And I thought that she did a really great job leading us down that path in uh, in putting those Easter eggs in front of us. Uh -huh. Yes, that but face. did it have to be 12 locks? Like that seemed <laughs> so on the nose that he, that well, he locked yeah. all 12 locks on his way out uh, it, and I was just like, I could get it. Uh -huh. She has mm -hmm. nice lockpicks now and she's in a hurry and like, it's supposed to be suspenseful, mm -hmm. but I was like 12, 12 locks. And also here's the thing, like Annika, Annika, who is the, yeah. um, Nick. the Nick. Yes. She is the warehouse foreman. She is the person who helps them run their, um, underground business, their smuggling business. She probably has all 12 on the same keychain. Like, that's that's a flaw in the system. Exactly. Exactly. So it was like, 12 is too many. Yeah. But like, put, like, the whole point was about the chub lock, which is a mm -hmm. an unpickable lock that gets picked. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And again, also historical accuracy about that whole thing. Yeah. Read the afterword, you guys. It's really great. Yeah, the uh, afterword was prime. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so like, yeah, the whole like 12 locks thing was kind of a hot mess. I did not love it, but I enjoyed mm. the metaphor of it. I liked it. It really built, built tension because she had to get to him quickly or he'd freeze to death. Like it was, it, it, do you remember when we played a role-playing game? And, yes. And yes. And vividly. That? Okay. that is seared into my brain. 
<laughs> yes, uh, you can go back and listen to that episode, I think. Did we post that? Yeah, it excellent. It's out there, yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, so it, this is often a mechanic in role-playing games, which is a timer. You have so many turns to complete your thing or bad shit happens. So I, I really... Uh, I really liked that. It be it built tension for me that there was two doors worth of locks uh, to protect their smuggling ice, their smuggled ice. Did you get in this book that they smuggled things in the ice? Yes. Okay. I It took me a couple of books in the series to realize that they froze things in the ice versus they just framed the entire like everything they put ice around everything and put everything sort of in the middle like a little nucleus of smuggled goods oh, i mean yeah it's sort of that is kind of implied a little bit mm -hmm. that it's yeah it's just like carved out in the center of the ice block and not that it is frozen mm. in the ice um yes i didn't I, get that at all uh, i thought it was like there are the goods and then there are the ice blocks, and they use the ice blocks as a like a shield or a screen. They talk about the melt a lot, and they how talk about the melt, the melt a lot. is yeah. important. Um, and I thought that was just an ice like a, an ice thing. Ice. <laughs> yeah, it's just an ice thing. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, come to this book, you guys. It's got an ice thing. <laughs> See, if you've got a thing for ice play, they do that a little bit. Uh -huh. A little um, bit, a tiny and bit. And I was worried about her buttocks on the ice, much more so than the bench. Oh. Okay, all right, okay. So we both had buttock worries. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> what was your hot take of Wicked and the Wallflower? Um, so I think feel like I'm frequently conflating the hot take with the naked question at uh, the uh -huh. end of the episode. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. yes, I thought that this was a really great beginning to a series. It immediately made me want to know more. I sus I mean, now I know that there's a third one and it's about Ewan, but mm -hmm. I suspect that in that one, we learned that he is not the villain we are all thinking he is right now. Um, yeah. Um, I so here's the thing, and we can talk about this when I finally read the third book. But I okay. in my head, uh, so this is a little bit of like casting with currently like actors who are yeah. currently doing stuff. So uh, uh -huh. and I'm gonna feel bad because I don't remember this person's real name. Um, on Great. the Good Trouble, the Kay. the guy who owns Speculate, who is like super stoic and on the spectrum and has like issues yeah. articulating okay. his emotional needs. Uh -huh. That in my head, Ewan looks like that, acts like that, is mm -hmm. like that, which is great and very hot and it works for me. But, um, mm -hmm. but like all of his conversations when he's like, you're just convenient and we're just going to make this happen. Like, I didn't take that as callousness. Mm -hmm. I took that as this is how he's processing and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and not like he's just being dismissive because he's mad. Sure. Um, uh, in my head, Ewan is like surfer bro. Like he's got like his ha because he doesn't take care of himself. Like his ha his hair's a little long and scraggly and like beach like beach PC and like he's got just like a little bit of scruff because he had to go surfing this morning. He couldn't shave first thing. Come on, um, and he's just a little like cool bro dude, d whatever dude. Like just a little out there. But he's so calculating in the first book. Like, he's yeah, so precise. Yeah. yeah, but also, what if he was a surfer? <laughs> interesting. That I did not get an impression, but interesting. Um, no, no. It, this is 100% my take, is that he's just, he looks, he has the appearance more so than the uh, mannerisms of a surfer dude. Um, for me, back to this book. Wicked yes. and the oh, Wallflower. Yes. Uh, yeah, anyways, yes, read it. You get caught up in all of it. You want to talk about all of mm -hmm. them. Yes, my hot take is yes and more, please. Uh, same. I am very, I, very hot for Devil. I like a 
tall, dark, handsome, mysterious uh, guy. Like, it, it, you wear an impeccable suit? Tell me more. Show me more. Uh, the bath scene? Sarah McLean can write a bath scene. Let me tell you what. Uh, it was delightful. Um, yeah, I, I really liked Devil. I really liked it a lot. I liked him a lot. Yeah. I liked him more than Felicity. I'm going to say it. I'm just going to say I it. I mean, me too. She had a lot of self-doubt that she had to work through. Yeah. He was sort of already past his self-doubt in a bigger way. He yeah. still had self-doubt. He didn't think himself worthy of her um, standing mm -hmm. in society. And he didn't trust yeah. when she said that she didn't need it anymore. But uh, short of that, he was very self-assured in a lot of other ways. And she had to work through a lot more of her doubts and her questions so yeah agree yeah i am really big for the immediately smitten trope so like devil was just like immediately smitten with her and like i can't i guess that's technically like a love at first sight or maybe like a sub genre of sub trope of love at first sight i love it i can't I to can't be fair not, i can't not to be fair. He was, uh, it was a, a crazy barb in the dark at first sight, right? Like, she said yeah. some stuff, and then he saw her. Um, yeah. And he was curious from the first verbiage yeah. rather than the first mm -hmm. look at her. But also, yes. X, thank you. Thank you for quantifying specifics. Um, uh, that was unnecessary. So I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's fine. I think I know the answer, but did this book make you want to get naked? Um, so I'm going to say surprisingly yes, because I don't think of myself mm. as a person who gets hot for historicals. Uh, but mm -hmm. again, whispering bench and uh, uh, him being like, write my face, please. And then she does. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really hot for women in control of uh, their yeah. needs. And yeah. then, and then there are several other instances in which he hesitates, and she's literally she literally grabs him by the dick and and does what she needs to to get places, which is exactly what one should do. Grab them by the dick to you... get places. Okay, great. Why did you get quiet saying that? I just just I just want like, to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> so because in my head, yeah, I was running through the scene on the roof. And I was like, oh, sure. did she actually grab him by the deck or did mm -hmm. they just talk about it? Um, mm -hmm. So, no, I was like trying to reenact that scene in my head while also speaking, uh -huh. which apparently is hard to do because that's a very good scene. <laughs> you are <laughs> correct. Um, uh, this book was, yes, I got naked as well. Uh, multiple times very hot very steamy you're you hit the nail on the head when you are uh when you talked about women uh pursuing their pleasure that like i liked that a lot and and as i mentioned the fact that he was already into her like he was into her from chapter one like that also amplified it like all the bits all the pieces worked like dark shadowy hot guy totally into her getting the power like all the pieces fell right into place uh and the rest of the series is equally delightful in that regard so i'm very excited for your journey well i'm halfway through the second one and i have to say that mm -hmm. uh, beast's character was very intriguing in the first one i sort of mm -hmm. love a dark and silent almost mm -hmm. as much as i like a dark and clever so his like grunting is super adorable. Not mm -hmm. in real life. Real life people should use their full sentences. But a fictional yeah. mm -hmm. one, yes, please. A little bit of absolutely uh, vocal uh, grunting will go a long way in in a historical mm -hmm. communication. So I was very excited for his storyline. I'm a little less excited for the third one, and because I really wanted yeah. Dahlia to to have a a different adventure than the one I think she's gonna have, but I'm gonna wait. <laughs> okay. Okay. What are you what's the adventure that you're expecting? I would 
would like her to like I love that she was her own woman with her own rules and her mm -hmm. own like I don't know I kind of wanted a lesbian storyline for her oh okay but you recognize that in a romance book structure you know that it but has Nick to, is there to... and I I need Nick's story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no spoilers. Ah, okay. I was going to say that face is spoiler enough. I'm good. <laughs> Damn it. No, no, no more. You get no more of this face. All right. Okay. So you guys, in case, like I said, yes, read these. You get mm -hmm. very committed to it. You get really into these characters, um, yeah. particularly the men. And I don't usually get into the men. Um, <laughs> in That's what she said. That is that is what she sometimes said. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, I had a great time reading this book. I'm yeah. really excited that there are more back catalogs mm -hmm. from Sarah McLean, mm -hmm. uh, which I might be tearing through on on our yeah. while we wait for yeah. the second bombshell to come out. <laughs> yeah, I I find it really. I think so. I think it goes Hell's Bells bombshell, um, and so there's another series. But about, so we're just working backwards through her right. catalog. Yeah, yeah. So there's so like characters that show up in this bare knuckle bastard series will be in this previous series, and we're just gonna work our way backwards through. Right. So because I them. think there's like daring and the Duke, or like the mm -hmm. how to get the the Duke thing. Uh, well, so daring and the Duke is the third in the bare knuckle bastards, and then oh. there is the the numbers series, like nine yes. ways to romance a rake. That's it. Is, that's it. Yes. Yeah. The, and that's like the, ten the ways to do this and eleven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The numbers series, um, and those characters, I believe, show up in this bare knuckle bastard series, and maybe in the bombshell book. I I can't remember at this point because that book has so many like badass female side and tertiary characters. We d in bombshell Felicity is in bombshell definitely. Oh I yeah. Her. So I. I remember there's like all these women with all these children. Right. So but those Felicity, were like her yeah. sisters. Yeah. Is that one of her? Was she one of them? Okay. I believe so. That Felicity was there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, that they like, when they were putting makeup on her, um, mm -hmm. it was Felicity's kids. Cool. But like, I I'm don't remember that. why they're in a house in the country and not in Covent Gardens. Ah, oh, another face. Oh, your face is. <laughs> I have no face. I'm a person with no face. No oh, face this, no more. The, I love that you have book tells and I'm also <laughs> equally enamored with the fact that I can read your book tells. I don't know. No, you don't. You know nothing. <laughs> This has been a delightful discovery <laughs> of plot points that I have not read yet. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> You're welcome. Please continue on to the next book. Um, yeah, I'm very excited. I'm very excited for your future reads. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for an episode of Booklandia. For more Booklandia, follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at l.skyford, Twitter at skyfordl, and hit up our blog, lskyford.com. We love you to the moon and back, so don't forget to rate and subscribe. Our eternal thanks for the audio editing and support provided by Finnegan Murphy, who you can find on Twitter at Finnegan1, that's F-I-O-N-N-E-G-A-N, numeral one, and sometimes Sky herself. <laughs>